it's seven o'clock on a Thursday, which means it's time for our really big violin class. Um, <laughs> Brendan's asked if someone can play the countdown theme. That's, you can do that next week, all right? Um, some people have been asking me why I've decided to call this the really big violin class. So I thought I would start by telling that story for those of you who don't know already. When I was at the Cleveland Institute of Music for school, uh, for university, we had two kinds of violin class. We had little class, which was just uh, the professor you were studying with and, and your own studio. And my violin teacher had little class every Thursday, which might be the, the sentimental reason I chose Thursdays at two, because that's when violin class was. Um, those classes were amazing. And I got that's where I got to learn about pieces like These I Balad, I'll Never Forget That. Uh, also never forget hearing Tim Ying play the Kreutzer Sonata in little class. Um, just unforgettable performances and an introduction to the violin repertoire happened during those classes. And then in Cleveland, once a month, we had big class. And big class is when all of the violin studios got together in, there was this, this room on the corner that was windows all the way around. And um, big class was a different story altogether because the whole violin faculty would sit at a table and it felt very much like a jury and it was intimidating and um, definitely a scary experience for me, but it was also a real honor to get invited to play in big class because everyone was coming together. So my idea of really big class is sort of a play on, on those two things because we're inviting teachers and, and players and violinists and musicians from all over the world to come together for a couple of hours on a Thursday to hear violin repertoire. And um, last week I was reminded of the idea that uh, when, whenever you play a piece of music, there's a good chance that someone listening has never heard it before. So that's something to remember in these classes that someone out there listening, they might be in on in the Zoom meeting, they might be out on YouTube, they might come back a week from now and hear it. And they've never heard these pieces of music before. And that's such a, a privilege for us as players, but also a wonderful experience for listeners. The other thing I wanted to just say about this idea of really big class is that I'm just so excited that it's working and that um, we're able to bring together people. So today we have performers from, we have two people from the UK, um, one from the Northern, uh, where I teach, one of my students, and another from the Wells School. Um, we have someone from Mexico, we have someone from San Francisco, and our teachers in Canada. So this is really this idea of the big class. And then one other thing about really big class is I've always noticed that cellists, you know, they get together and they talk about cello stuff. They're kind of maniacal about it, actually. It's hard to get cellists to stop talking when there's more than one of them. And violists, they sort of band together in a, in a solidarity against the rest of us. And violinists, like, we just stay in our practice rooms. We just go in our corners and we never get together. And so this is a chance for us to come out of our corners and, and uh, experience some music together. So that's my little spiel about the class. And now I get to talk about Barry Schiffman, our guest teacher today. So I've known Barry for a really long time. We met first at the BAMP Center as students, actually. We were there together in the chamber music program one June, and his quartet was the St. Lawrence Quartet. And they were, they were really good. And I really, really admired them and, and was just amazed that I got to be in this program at the same time as these, these amazing musicians. And that's where I met Barry. And then, I don't know, I think we crossed paths a few times in New York. You had infamous uh, reading sessions that I think I, I happened in on a few times. Canadian Thanksgivings that, that I might have come, come to occasionally. But it was really in California where I, I next saw you, where, when you were teaching at Stanford. And I was in the Cypress Quartet, we lived in San Francisco. And those two places are not that far apart, about an hour with bad traffic, hour and a half. Um, but because life in a quartet is so frantic and busy, you don't really see other people. <laughs> you see your quartet and you go on tour. So I was always aware of what you were doing and occasionally we'd be at the same things, but, but we've sort of led, led these parallel lives 
40 miles apart. Um, and then we've seen each other again in Banff when you're, you've been involved with the International String Quartet competition there. And in Toronto, when you invited my quartet to come judge a competition there, I think that was in our last year together. But I think my most memorable time with you was in that last year that the Cyphers was together when we played Brahms sextets together. Yeah. And we just had an amazing experience, at least I did. But you were playing viola. So that, that, was, that was a new thing for me to observe. Cool. Really and busy. and you're allowed to be here even though you've ventured off the the violinist path. So, one of the things about Barry that I think is worth noting is that he's had these these incredible successes in a lot of different areas as a player, as an administrator, as a visionary, as a leader, and I know that all of those things are going to come into play in the class today. And I can't wait to hear what you have to say to these wonderful violinists who are going to play for us. So that's enough talking. I'm done. I had more. I have notes here, but that's enough. Um, we're going to have an, a performance of the Sibelius Concerto, about a third of the first movement, I think, from Nellie. Nellie is 16. She lives in Somerset. She studies with Simon Smith and great. enjoy her Sibelius. Great. Thanks. Take it away, Nellie.
Great. Wow. Okay. Thank you, Nelly. Wow. What a what an excellent violinist. Now, you guys can hear me okay? Everybody can hear me okay? Yes. Excellent. Okay. So, um, Nelly, your your microphone is hopefully on so you can talk back because I'll ask you some questions, yeah? Okay, excellent. Um, so I could start by telling you all the things that I think were great or all the things I think that you could work on, but I want to actually start by asking you, Nelly, um, if you could identify for all these wonderful violinists um, listening, what are the things when you were to, when you were going to sell me on how great Nelly is, what are the things that you do really well that you know you do well that they're, you know, they're, they're your go-tos. You, you know, I don't know if it's your vibrato or your bow or your confidence or what are those things that you know in your pocket? I think I have a good ability to connect with music and understand how it relates to the emotions that I put into it. Okay. So yeah, I think you're, you're a, good. Okay. So you're, you're a, an expressive player and you feel like you can, you can, um, you can use the instrument and, 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 and get across your message. Yeah. Yeah. What are some of the other strengths you have? Um, um, I don't know. I like, I like that I can often change. My... Sorry. I don't know what that was. You have, um, friends. You have, you have friends. I guess that's a good thing. People like <laughs> Yeah, I'd say that I, I'm happy with how my bow changes in the long phrases. Yeah, good. Okay. You can imagine my next question, which is basically, what are the things that, yeah, not, not really your strengths right, right now? Um, I feel like I could work on my shifts. Mm -hmm. and, what about? And I think can, making sure that, oh, about my shifts. Mm -hmm. I think making sure that the timing is right so I can, you know, so I'm, I'm making sure that everything works together. Yeah, sure. Okay. I think that's fair. Great. Um, I think it's really important to know what your strengths are. Um, because, you know, the thing is when you walk on stage, especially in a concerto, there are basically 90 people there and a good 35 of them want to be you. They sort of want to be in the orchestra, but they really want to be you. They want to be the soloist. And um, you have to walk out on stage. And from the second you walk on the stage, you have to establish very clearly that you're the only person that's supposed to be there. Because you're the best violinist in the world at that exact moment. And that can sound kind of conceited or, you know, a little bit full of yourself, whatever you want, however you want to describe it. It's a tool. It's a tool to get you over the hump of incredible difficulty of what we are actually doing. So we have to have a kind of faux sense of confidence. We walk on stage. We, not, not me, not you. We don't walk on stage. We, the performer of Sibelius Concerto, the best violinist in the world at that exact moment. Forget about it, Josh Bell. You don't mean anything. It's all about me right now. That kind of confidence allows you to be able to overcome some of the obstacles. Okay, so how do we do that? What are the things that we can bring that, that give us that sense of extrovert confidence? And a lot of that has to do with going, I want to go back to that first strength that you identified, which was you basically said you're a really musical player, right? And I think that's really true. I had the sense sometimes listening to you play, it's a hard thing to describe really, but I felt like you are observing yourself. Almost I could see there's Nelly playing the violin and there's, you know, sort of bored from the exorcist. There's Nelly in the corner, kind of watching Nelly play and observing. I didn't feel that you were absolutely in control of everything you wanted me to, um, to experience. That doesn't mean that being in control doesn't mean that everything you're doing is succeeding, 
but everything you're doing, you are doing. As opposed to you're a really good violinist, you have a beautiful sound, you're very musical, and that allows you to kind of, I won't say sit back, but to play at a certain level without really controlling everything. Now, and that, that, that relates back to your comment about your shifts, which if you don't, if you don't really control a shift, it doesn't take care of it by its, it does, the shifts don't take care of themselves. Bow speed, yeah, you can kind of go, you know, along like this from the frog to the tip, you can vibrate, play in tune, play beautiful sound, you're about 80% of the way there. But shifting, that is a, that is a kind of um, window into your soul. A shift is, is not about getting from one note to another, a shift is about making me as a listener feel a certain type of connection between those two notes and what method of shifting I use gives me as a listener a completely different um, uh, emotional reaction. And so that's the sort of thing where I'm saying you're observing because sometimes your shifts were unusually, um, you know, sometimes they worked and sometimes they didn't. And I, I could feel and I could actually see in yourself a kind of, huh, that's odd. I wonder why that didn't work. Uh, rather than you saying, this is the shift I'm doing, I'm going to shift, you know, into the new finger with the new bow, kind of like a hyphen shift, or I'm going to shift slowly on the previous finger and then plop down the new finger, but I'm going to connect it. I didn't really feel that. So that's not saying that you can't do it. It's just saying that the choice of what shift you're actually doing at the time wasn't so clear. And we'll go through, we can look at a couple of those shifts. Now, um, that's just one small thing, but I think because you're such a good violinist, you can, you can have a field day trying to figure out all the wonderful different types of shifts. And, okay, now let's see who's on, uh, all of you have turned up your cameras, but that's okay. I think I'm the oldest person in the room. So here we go. Um, Nelly, give me your top three violinists um that you listen to go uh, ahead david oistrakh uh and the rock oistrakh uh, and who else pardon david oistrakh van groff van groff yep and nigel kennedy and nigel oh excellent okay those are three really um interesting choices i like them all um let's see um who else is on here? I just see a bunch of, let's see, who would be good? How about Emily Blaney? Are you with us today, Emily? Can you turn on your camera and tell me three violinists that you love listening to? Uh, I really like Yanine Janssen. Mm, oh, yeah. Whew. Strong. Yeah. Um, I also really like Henning Ragorod. Um, I think he's really cool. Mm -hmm. Um... Um, Anna Sophie Mutter. Anna Sophie Mutter. Okay, excellent. All right, let's see. One more question. Brendan Howell. Three violinists that you love listening to. Hi, Brendan. Oh, Brendan, there we go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Sorry, my hair is a terrible mess. Uh, right. The barbers have been closed for weeks. Uh, I'd, I'd say. Janine Janssen as well. Um, okay. uh, Christian Tetzlaff. Hmm, interesting. Um, mm, oh, uh, oh, and uh, Julia Fisher. Great. All wonderful choices. And I will say more enlightened choices than some of my students sometimes give me in Canada, which, you know, I think reflects that, that uh, some of you are based overseas and listening to I think a wider palette of playing. But if you were to ask all of those players to list their favorite violinists, I don't think Janine Janssen would choose. I think Oistrakh would have been there. And then there'd be a lot of other dead people. Right? So I think you need to listen to dead violinists. I think that's my, okay, that's my message for today. What happened on the really big violin class is that Barry told you that dead violinists are what you should listen to. 
Okay, Cecily, I think my time here is done. Everybody should go listen to Deb. What am I talking about, Nelly? I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be ridiculous, but I'm being a bit ridiculous. Um, Tasha Zeidel was a violinist that studied with Leopold Auer. And I think we all know who Leopold Auer was and who he taught and, um, and all those violinists that came from the Auer class. Let's think, think who they were, right? Think, you know, Heifetz and Milstein, all these crazy, brilliant, expressive violinists that each sounded very, very much different. Tasha Zeidel released a recording of a piece that he wrote called Oi, oi, oi. Now, I might be getting him wrong, and maybe the piece is wrong, but it's a good story anyways. Basically, oi, 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 you can look it up, you can probably find it, um, was just this kind of cheesy melody in a kind of quasi-Jewish manner that is like a, a lesson in, in vocal shifting from one note to the other. The the use of expressive shifts in the early part of the century is a treasure trove. I encourage you, go listen to all of those violinists from that period and listen to how they use shifts and what sort of shifts and how different they are. So um, that's just a kind of, you know, I think I see Leslie Ashworth, one of my former students, uh, she's listening and Leslie knows how much I, I like listening to, um, to old violinists, dead violinists. I don't know what it is. We sound better when we die. So, um, all right. Another, another quick observation about your playing. What makes it good is also a challenge. What makes it good? You have this incredible quality of even sound. I mean, it's, and that's hard to do. And I know we all practice that, right? Just the kind of extraordinary, even bow speed and good vibrato and, and okay, but the flip side of that is that um, if everything is even, then we lose the power of the impact that even playing can have. If everything is even, and I'm not saying everything is, but you know, for the most part, the bow speed was fairly unchanging and there's something about the way that this piece is written that that I think you know speaks to that but if you look a little closer dolce and espressivo first of all I really appreciated that you didn't play pianissimo or kind of quasi pianissimo deadissimo no vibrato, barren, because, I don't know, that became kind of popular. I, I never really understood that, because Sibelius, right? Mezzo forte, dolce and espressivo, which I think you did really well. But the espressivo, I think you could you could do espressivo um, by deciding which notes you're going to speak to me. And what am I talking about? So you have this and I could so I could I could sing it like this. I could go kind of beautiful. I mean I'm not a very beautiful singer, but or I could do and so there's almost a new word, a new syllable on that A. And what does that do? It makes me, as a listener, feel the distance between G and A, and I feel much more the distance between A and D. Do you want to just start it again and play for us a little bit and kind of exaggerate that idea of speaking the changes? little bit I have to take it on faith because with zoom sound it's hard to tell those 
touch nuances, but I could feel already that Now, if you were to bring out that A, in a way that I could feel it a bit more, what are your tools for doing that? Um, probably bow speed and vibrato. Bow speed and vibrato. Okay, what's your fingering on the A? Um, I do a four. You do a fourth finger, right? Okay. Um, for what it's worth, that's why I start on second finger, but that's just my own thing. Most people don't like to start on second finger. Um, but you have the world's longest fourth finger. You're, you're incredibly gifted with those fingers, so I don't think fourth finger is any issue if you're to vibrate. Um, bow speed, I really liked what you said about bow speed. And absolutely, that's, that's true. But you can only use bow speed if you have bow in the bank. And when you got to the A, you didn't have any bow in the bank. So you had no option of increasing your bow speed unless you wanted to like drive off of the bridge. T so I would suggest T saving, 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 spend. Better, better, better. Um, what would happen if that first note was twice as long as normal? What would happen? Could you do that? Do that one more time. Really feel how slow you have to draw the bow when the note is twice as long. Now, using that bow speed, Play as written. Ooh. I, for me, I like that better. You know, I like that you, you're using bow speed in a more interesting way. Now, um, it's very hard because you're, you know, you recorded that in the room and there's no piano and no orchestra, um, but. Uh, without going into too many details, I would just watch a couple places um, your rhythm because it's not not exactly um, correct, and it's it's not exactly correct in that you were just um, taking liberties. I think just a couple places you didn't really feel the transition from bum bum. Da, 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 de, the real inner triplet. So that's a small thing in this piece. Anybody that knows me knows that's a bit of a, a pet peeve. Um, one more idea that I think we can explore, which is really fun, um, and I like I like exploring this with 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 young violinists because for some reason, um, young violinists today uh, do a remarkably good job of. Sticking the bow to the string. I mean, just in the most. I mean, you guys are really great at that. Um, what you're not so great at is using this. You see what I'm doing? My bow is nowhere near my violin as a tool for articulation. So, what am I? What am I talking about? Okay. If you look at. Um, You know that section? Could you could you start from from here? Nelly, thanks, Nelly. Beautiful. So, um, you're doing a bit. You're doing it a bit more now that I mentioned. But um, 
you you have to be a little fearless so what i'm talking about um my students know i like to reference um the cartoon character zorro you know zorro you know zorro cecily he's the guy with the sword right and he goes and he uses his bow his sword through the air and i think if you use it so you come from above i'm off screen whack now i would challenge that nobody on screen has practiced this practice well, we can all can do that I think we should practice at the tip smacking the hell out of it with articulation because that's exactly the stroke that you need when you play on the chords right BAM so you come from above you smack the bow down and at the moment that the bow hits the string Lots of weight goes into the stick and it, it glues it. It's like watching a gymnast dismount and they stick the landing, right? Use all the momentum and then bam. Or another, another um, image is a plane. If you watch a plane coming in for landing, right? They come in on this angle and then they tilt up right before they land and then the wheels hit the runway, the front wheels come down, and at the second that the front wheels hit the runway, the flaps go <laughs> straight up and push the plane, push the plane into the ground. So they're using, those are the same principles that we want to use. Leverage and then lots of weight into the stick and it glues it so it doesn't go but okay let's try so really exaggerate come off the string and then smack it and stick it good one more time so nelly nelly just just if you don't mind do a few times just um just the first chord, just hitting the first chord, so we really hear it. Just, just don't, don't bother, don't bother rolling over to the E string. Let's just hear. Again. Good. Now, as you play that up bow. Take your violin and push it up against the bow. So watch this. Rather than pushing the bow down to the violin, push the violin physically up to the ceiling. Even more aggressively. Right, and you have to time it so that the upward motion happens at the same time that your downward smack happens. So, one of the things that, that happens, I can't see you terribly well, but I'm gonna guess, you have, do you have a shoulder pad on your violin? Yes. Is that a yes? I can't see. Yes, can, we, can you put it near the camera? What kind of, of shoulder pad is it? It's the... Kuhn shoulder. Oh, very good. Well, Marina Kuhn is a very close friend of mine. She's a lovely person, and she comes from the same city that Cecily's husband comes from, which is Ottawa. This and is true, Barry, and, and I'm giving you a two-minute warning. Okay, and Mrs. Kuhn lives in Ottawa, used to be married to Mr. Kuhn, who was a bow maker, really excellent bow maker. And I love Marina Kuhn, and she's very generous. She gives lots of money to young artists. I also use a coon, but I take it off the violin for 10 minutes every day and practice without it. 
because what I find is it frees me up a bit. So when I go to do like that, I'm not locked in by the by the rest. Because if I have the shoulder rest on, I have to go and I have to arch my lower back. But if I don't have the shoulder rest on, it's just like lifting a, a weight. So could you do me a favor and take your shoulder pad off for a second? Yeah. And I'm not going to make you play much without it because I know how terrible that can feel. But now that your shoulder pad is off, can you lift the violin in the air as you bring the bow down? Yeah. Okay. So these are, I, Nelly, I, I, you know, I should just say, um, I should have said at the beginning, uh, the point of master classes, especially in a situation like this, it has little to do about trying to make you play any differently or better. It's more to use you as a vehicle to explore for everybody listening, some of these concepts. So I know that's not necessarily the most fun for who's ever on the receiving end, but I appreciate you playing along with this. So could you now try doing this? Now I'm going to make you do one more thing. This is going to be really weird for you. Take your chin and your head completely off the violin. Just tilt your hand up like that so you're holding the violin in your hand. So you're really free. Like a, like a country violin player. Celtic fiddle. Okay? Obviously, I'm not going to make you do that too much um, in front of whoever is watching. But the idea of that is that you become very good at feeling the connection with the violin, whether it's here or here or here, and we're not locked in with our shoulder pad only here. But we're able to go... But wherever we need to move, we're there. Um, and I do think that 10 minutes a day without the shoulder pad, really helpful. And then I put mine back on. Okay. Barry, oh, I'm so sorry. I have to, we need to move on. Okay. Um, Nelly, you. Nelly, thank you so much for being game with that. And for my students who are listening, I, I know you're probably all laughing because I think I've said to you more than one of you last week that. 96 98 percent of the time i would tell you to start things from the string this is the other two percent <laughs> right there oh, oh, for goodness sake yeah this is this is a this is two percent not a nine and, and, it, you, and i can only raise it with you because you did 98 percent so well you as i said from the beginning you are just you're so comfy on the string you got that parts down Okay, who's next? Next we have Emily Blaney, who's gonna play some Glazunov for us. Oh, awesome, all right, Emily. And we had a hard time deciding um, where she should stop. So I think it's just, you sent what, five minutes or so. Perfect. This is a piece that has no clear uh, movement divisions, so. True, it's a, it's, a, it's a strange one. It's a great one though. So here's the opening of the Glazunov concerto. Thank <laughs>
Wow, thank you for that. Very beautiful playing, and and in a, in many ways, um, uh, quite a um, a similar violinistic approach um, to Nelly in that uh, you know very beautiful uh, changes of bow and 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 lots of full use of bow and and uh, very expressive expressive playing. Um, this piece, um, I just want to, before, before we go through, I just want to point out one, uh, one spot that uh, maybe will tie back to what we were exploring with Nelly. Uh, let me just find it. Uh, da, 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 da. If you look at number, I, I hope you have the same type of part I do. Uh, do you have the big number seven in your part? This is the Pimoso after. Yeah. Da, da, da. Yeah? Yeah. Could you just play uh, maybe from the bar before seven and then play a couple bars of seven and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Good, good. So we have very good arrival. You did a great job. And the next note. Come off the string, be off and smack. Want to try it? Yeah, don't be afraid. One, two, um, yeah, because. A is really easy to play loud. It's on the E string. It's nice and long. It's a very, you know, and then you got that little D. And what we hear is Right? We want to hear So, you know, um, I had the opportunity many times to be on stage um, Sometimes I was playing, you know, as a member of an orchestra, when really great, like the great, like Perlman and Zuckerman and all those great violinists of the of the 80s and 90s, um, when they were on stage, um, there's a lot of noise happening when you're sitting right beside them. I mean, when you're like one foot from them, it doesn't sound as beautiful as it sounds on the recording. Their articulations are like crazy. And that's why when they're playing um, concertos with orchestra, we can hear with, hear them so well, right? So I don't think you're in any danger of over articulating. Okay. Now, this piece. Okay. I feel you're quite comfortable playing as though the piece is quite stationary. <laughs> kind of, you know, solid. And I think there is a sense of that. But there's also a sense of turmoil, even implied turmoil at the beginning in the sound. So I don't think it's as um, stable as you're presenting it. Um, what am I talking about? Well, how can I explain this? So it's about sound rather than uh, let me see. I don't. I don't think on Zoom we can really explore this too well. Uh, that's a kind of stable, more or less in the world you're playing. Um, turmoil, uh, instability, movement within the notes. 
la la ba ba pi a di do li do do. So this, how do I get that feeling of, you know, like at any moment something terrible might happen. Okay, I'm gonna exaggerate. I could play really smoothissimo. Or I could, in my bow, in my vibrato, inflect in the sound that feeling of scary, insta unstable, where are we going? I'm exaggerating a little bit of the portato to give you an, but it's within that world that I'd like you to explore. So, so a little bit of that. And you, you can put that in the sound with vibrato, with, but you know how to do it. Try. Let's hear. Good. Uh, it's hard to tell um, over Zoom how much sound you have. Um, I think that the shape of long notes could be more interesting than the, I'm gonna, you know, it's, I would say that's a little bit New York approach. Very, you know, very even and consistent. I'm looking for less even. I wanna see that note go down in the valley and up over the hill and down in the valley, you know. Uh, and I get, you know, I, I after some of the violinists that you mentioned, definitely uh, Yanin, Jansen, Oistrak, I hear a lot of that in their playing. Where I'm at every note, I'm like, what? Where are we going? Want to try? Yeah, okay. <laughs> For me, that's much more interesting, and and I feel like you're you're taking you're pulling me somewhere. Okay. Um, can you go to um, number one, and then play through the first couple bars of number two, and then we'll stop you. Very good. Um, I, I really liked a lot of that. I thought at number one, uh, again, could have a little bit more feeling of moving forward, but you, yeah. you, had, you had it. You just, I think you could, you could do more of it. Now, when you get to number two, ta -da -dum, ta -da -dum, ta -da -dum, the forte on that A, I it's think another one of those. Well, yeah, there's lots of ways to do it. You could go. I actually do it down bow. But if you do it up bow, which is possible, you just got to work twice as hard. Yeah. Uh, and then I think we want to hear. I want to hear each of the first notes of the triplets 
La pa la la pa la 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 Vibrato, 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 vibrato. At least try to vibrate them. Di wa do la 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 I don't need to hear do la do da da do da da. I don't need all those notes. Wanna try? Da wa do da la do da la do da ya po ba yum. That is one of the most awkward, yucky passages, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, it's just terrible. Because what happens is that our hand, in order to make the octave, is now in a locked, closed, in a straight jacket position, right? So when I say vibrate, da -da -yum, you have to release. If you try to go, da -yum, da -da, the hand is locked. Oh, uh, uh, hand lock. Uh, that doesn't work, but this works. Release the fingers on the note you want to vibrate. You have more time than you think. I would practice just kind of like this. I don't need to hear the other notes. So I play very soft on them, very light. For now, this is an exercise to get your freedom, left hand freedom on the notes that you want to pop. Do you want to try? So very soft, very light, just, just play some. And as an exercise, Emily, um, you can play quite quick on the little notes and then just slow, big vibrato, big long bow on the note you want to vibrate. Okay, should I try it? Yeah, try it. <laughs> this is an exercise, right? To build. So when you vibrate the da -da -da, the biggest, most exaggerated, super expressive vibrato, again, this is a caricature of what you're going to do. So you have to exaggerate it. Your, this is just an exercise. Da -da -da, da -da -da, da -da -da. Try. Okay. Very good. Now just play the passage normally. Already, for me, I can hear more vibrancy in the notes I was looking for. Of course, it's just the beginning of your work, right? But I'm curious, when you played it now, just normally, when you got to the notes that you had been vibrating, did it have a kind of physical memory? Could you, did it feel different on those notes than before? Um, yeah. I mean, yeah. That's, what, that's what you're going to be looking for. You're looking, you're looking for creating a kind of physical memory, so that when you're play, playing it fast, that you can engage that vibrato that you practice really quickly. Like little electric shocks going off in your bicep. And the other two notes, passive in the left hand, and just picked out with your, with your right hand. So you don't worry about vibrating them. Right. Try one more time. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, if, if I was practicing this, should I then afterwards go back and do it with the other notes as well? Or is this just to bring out the middle line? Well, that's now you're getting into, I guess, an interpretive question. 
it, it, my my feeling is the other notes will take care of themselves. First of all, there's a bow change on this ta da dum ta da dum ta, so that I don't worry about. And I think so. Bum ba dum ba dum ba dum ba dum ba dum ba dum is the more interesting. So what do they got? Do they got? You know, you know, you know. That's what I, I want to bring. Oh, sorry, I can't remember what I'm trying. Um, oh, try try one time. Number, try playing one more time at number two, but as written. Oh right, okay. Very nice. Um, just small detail. I I find it. Um, tempting to to um, do that calando marking um, or, or the slowing down a little bit early um, but I would avoid that because I find that transition kind of long so I would just you know it's easier with piano keep the momentum going okay let's go to the most beautiful part of romantic violin writing, which is that the voice of reason comes in, everything's going to be okay. Isn't that the most beautiful spot in the whole concerto? I just love that. Um, I don't think you have to start so low in the bow. Again, this is very personal. I find I'm able to sculpt the sound a little easier in the upper part. Yeah? You want to try? Stay in the upper part. Dolce tranquilo. I think what happens is I lose the tranquilo and then there's too much. Good. Now, Choice of fingerings is a very personal thing, right? Whether or not to go up the A string or to go over. If you decide to go over to the E string, which you just did, which was uh, right? It has to be as legato and as beautiful as So you have to work harder, and you just kind of plopped over. Yeah. So I'm not saying don't play it on the E string, but you got to work way harder if you're going to be be on the E string. Because I want to feel tall. I want to feel that interval. Want to try one more time? Yeah, do you want to try going up now? Okay. <laughs> ah. Yeah, I know, I know, it's risky. Um, but I think it's worth it. Personally, I would explore that. Maybe something like uh, three, one, three, one. You can anyways practice that so that you start to feel and then when you when you go over you you feel as though you're shifting up 
And you feel it strangely in your diaphragm as though you're singing. As though you're doing that sort of thing. You feel a kind of support here as you either go up or go over. Either way, I think it's about and the effort involved to show me the tension of that sixth. Okay? Now, one more thing at the Anamando. I would love to hear vibrato. Really? I remember we practiced on ta da la ta da 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 same idea. Can I hear you that a little bit at the end of my And really, really exaggeratedly vibrato on the second beat. Right. That's the idea, because really all that's about is. So we have. The rest doesn't really matter. One more time. Right. And I would be careful, don't hit the brakes as hard as you hit them in the second bar of the animato. Keep going. One more time. Try. You can you can do it. Don't hit the brakes. Go through that. Yeah, something like that. I would, I think what happens in this piece a lot is that we start adding a lot of rubato, which I think is okay. But the rubato, sometimes we forget actually what Glasnov asked us. And sometimes, um, we need to be reminded so that the rubato you you choose is based a little more closely on on what he's in, in that case he's asked us animados it's about going ahead and it's a kind of unnatural gesture to be honest so you have to practice it yeah good That's very i think we're about out of time for this amazing piece it's a, it's a great piece. Okay, here's a great story uh, with apologies to my dear... My, it doesn't matter who it was. It was Jeff. My dear friend in the St. Lawrence Quartet, we were, uh, he was telling me this hilarious story. When he was young and he went to the Banff Center, Banff is incredibly beautiful. Okay? Like, it's outrageously beautiful. And it's so beautiful that sometimes you don't want to practice. You just want to go hiking and, and, and play basketball and, and do whatever you want to do. And we did a lot of that as young people in Banff. Maybe too much. My friend loved this piece, like, like nobody loves this piece. We'd sing it, but you know what happens in like another page. It gets unbelievably hard, doesn't it? He refused to learn the hard part. And it made his pianist cry. <laughs> Which made us laugh. Anyways, I just had to share that story because I know what happens in about two pages in this piece. It's just like it's Emily who... knows too. <laughs> yeah. it's, the most... it's so awkward, and yeah, it's horrible. And the thing is, like I tell you, people walk out of the concert hall, and all they remember is the Glasnov concerto is so great. That's all they remember. Meanwhile, you've killed yourself on like four pages of the most awkward violin writing. Nobody remembers it. All right. On that, thank you, Emily. You, I can't. I've really only heard you play this on Zoom, and I can't wait to hear you play it in person because your sound is beautiful. I know, and um, yeah, that'll be a pleasure when that gets to happen.
I just wanted to follow follow up something Barry said about the noisiness of soloists. And Barry, I don't know if you remember a Brahms sextet rehearsal that we had early on. And we had probably two of the loudest cellists ever playing with us and probably two of the strongest violists also playing, you and, and Ethan. And then, you know, the second violinist wasn't exactly a soft player either. And then me on the top trying to, to hold my own. And I remember just yelling, I think. I think I lost my temper at one point in a rehearsal and said, would you guys stop making so much noise? Exactly. That piece is difficult. I mean, the poor first violin always gets buried. And we, we were being particularly un... un, un uh... We were just having fun, I think, right in the beginning. There was a lot of articulation. I think it would be fair to say that there was a lot of articulation. And what was interesting, Cecily, as you remember, is we didn't need it in the end because we were practicing for the recording. And in the recording, unlike playing on this on the on a big concert hall where you're articulating like crazy, in the recording, you actually do hear all that noise. So I remember <laughs> having to tone that down so that actually it, the microphones, you know, it's, it's a different type of play. Yeah, and I also got, had the benefit of my sound sailing out a little bit more in that space than in others, but that was there was a lot of noise. Um, Juan Carlos, have we sorted out our tech problems? He had a problem with his his computer, and he's come back on his phone, I think. So that's not ideal, but I'd rather have him here than not here. Are you here? Let's see. Can I help? I can't hear him. Oh, there he is. Yay. Okay, good. And <laughs> so, yeah, you, you'll be on your phone, which is only particularly sad because I know you're playing Bach. And one of the things that Zoom and iPhones really don't do well are double stops. But what we will do is share your video and then Barry will 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 go from there. So here is uh, the third movement, the slow movement of the um, Bach C major sonata. Okay, great. I just put up a score.
playing. Give me one second. I'm just going to pull up my music so I can find the... Uh, I don't have in front of me. Uh, give me one sec, Sassy. I just got to find this on my computer. Which I had open. There we go. Okay. I see it. Very beautiful. And it's Juan Carlos, yes? Yes. Where are you where are you joining us today from Juan Carlos? Where are you joining us today? Oh. We're okay. having trouble unmuting him. So give he's in Mexico. Okay, let's wait for him to, to reconnect. There he is. Okay. I've got two of you. I don't know which one to unmute. Can, can you please turn on my mind? Now we've got you now. <laughs> yeah, the, the thing is that I, I don't know why, but, but the, the internet is doesn't working quite well. So I'm using my instead my my own phone uh, data. So this no problem. No problem. You know, you know, I think. <laughs> Are we good? Yeah. <laughs> okay. He's back. All right. So I don't know if you were able to hear some of the things I was saying um, earlier to to the other violinists, Nelly and, and Emily. The, the idea of both of them very fine, even players, right? Like that. Even sound is really excellent in both of them. Okay. If you're always pulling even sound with even bow speed, while that's excellent, it also comes at a cost. So I would say the same thing to you. Okay. <laughs> really great job. It's so even. Ta da dum bum ba dum ba dum ta do di ba da do di do 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 do. And you're, I can. Feel how much you're putting into it, how musical inside you are. You know, I, I get it, right? I can see it. Um, but you're working twice as hard as you have to work, inserting or bringing all your musicality without letting your bow breathe. I think just by exaggerating the releases in your bow your musicality will come through so much clearer start again i'll show you what i mean play the first few the first bar You played the first three notes under a slur, yeah? Ta yeah. Okay. Do it one more time and really exaggerate the idea of release. Really exaggerate, like almost like make a caricature. So rather than ta le dom, ta dom, pa -dum. I want you to really exaggerate it. Without, without the bow, without the violin, if you were, and I'm not going to make you sing it, I'll sing it because I don't mind being embarrassed on the internet. Body, 
So all I'm doing differently than you is releasing. You know, a slur, a slur, a kind of marking of, okay, what's a slur? What is, if you have two or three notes and they have this marking under them, what does it mean? And this isn't just for you on colors. Anybody can answer that. Not Holy. a trick. Yeah. <laughs> it is that uh, you you have to to make a liaison between them. You have it, 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 it just right. Very good, Carlos. Absolutely correct. It's legato from one note to the other. That's one part of the message. What else does a slur mean? It also can show the, the phrase yes. where, where it, can, it can go. Right. A slur marking is an accent. It's a stress. At the mm. front of the slur, the front of the slur is a stress. The rest of the slur is not a stress. Dium, poium, poium, not do the it's so it's to it's to connect to the next note. Time, time, time. But it's also telling you that the first note in the group that slurred is somehow stressed. Not but that ability to go away and what happens is that the music begins to dance and it, it has a a lilt and a buoyancy a kind of yeah and it's very fun to play around with that try again I really exaggerate all the releases Carlos, I liked it a lot. I liked it much more. We have Tali. You played very correctly. In time. It was perfect. I don't know. I don't think it has to be perfect. I think you have lots of possibility for rubato. I think you could take a vacation between the third and the fourth notes. Just by giving this much time between those third and fourth notes, I'm able to tell a story. So I would like to see you exaggerate for now the releasing time and time between which notes you want. Okay. Let's try.
I like this better. I think you could exaggerate that more. And um, I don't think you have to play. I think you can play Bach with modern violin, modern strings, modern bow. I think you can play Bach with modern strings and Baroque bow. I think you can play Bach with gut strings and Baroque bow. Lots of different ways, right? But what I like to do is try to take the information from those early um, early equipment and how that responds and then bring it into my modern violin. Yeah? So I'm sure you played with Baroque bow before, Carlos? Uh, no, I never. I okay. All right. So one way to kind of fake or, you know, approximate what it feels like is to ch hold the bow a little higher. So hold the bow, I mean, you know, hold the bow like here. Just for fun. So you hold, you know, do you want to hold it there? Yeah. So now the bow feels very light, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's a little bit more like a Baroque bow. Now try. And one more thing. Stop vibrating. Just for fun. And I'm not saying that you can't. Of course, you can vibrate in Bach. But for now, turn vibrato off and try to do the stresses that you were doing with vibrato just with the bow. Yeah? Okay. Go ahead. that feel um, weird <laughs> weird right yeah um, and what's harder to do and what's easier to do uh, the chords are easier yeah. but the, but the legatos are, are harder right and the legatos are hard because you're trying to play them like to really connect right try the legatos with a slower bow speed and more release and then the separate notes more bow and lighter so yeah try Just where, just where you just played, I think you have um, a little more time to cadence. 
Take your time. Rather than Take your time. You have more time than you think for that cadence. Mm -hmm. Very good. So I asked earlier, you know, who are some of the violinists that you like to listen to? I'm curious for, um, and I, I'm not saying that there, there are lots of ways to play Bach. So I like it all. Um, and, and uh, you know, I believe that uh, wasn't uh, sharing a cultural ambassador for, for Mexico. Yeah. Henrik Sharon. <laughs> and uh, he surely played Bach very beautifully. Who else do you listen to? Well, uh, for Bach, I, I like to listen to uh, Rachel Potter. Yes. Isabel Faust, uh, Faust as well. And okay. of course, sharing. <laughs> so if you, if you prefer Rachel, you know how much she releases. Yeah. Isabel Faust. I was. I'm very sad. I, Rachel's a friend of mine. I was supposed to. Um, I was supposed to present her in recital in a in a couple of months in my festival in, in in the United States, and she was going to play a whole solo violin recital with Second Partita and and Bieber Passicalia and one of the cello suites on violin. And unfortunately, because of COVID, we had to cancel. <laughs> All time favorite violinists. So. Again to Rachel and listen how much she releases. Yeah? Yeah. Another violin, another uh, Bach player I really like is Sergei Maslov. Do you know him? Uh, no. He's crazy. I never met him, but this guy's a what he's just a wild man. Um, he was, I think he's a prize winner in the Michael Hill violin competition. And he's a spectacular viola player and DJ. And he plays, um, he plays the Dispala. You know the Dispala? You know what that is? Uh, no, That's no. It's a crazy big instrument that you play on your shoulder. Uh, the cello. Yeah. And some people think that's what Bach wrote the cello suites for. And, okay. uh, and he has the most incredible approach to playing Bach on this instrument. Cecily, I will send you a link. Or See, maybe I'll post yeah, a you... I'll post a link of Sergey on the on the Facebook site. Yeah, put it on our Facebook page. And Emily, if you could post um the violinist that you turned me on to as well to the Facebook. Yeah, just wild, wild. So um and I'm not saying to copy them, but I think the point is to see how far you can go from where you are now. There's like I was saying to release, and you released this much. And I say release a bit more, you release a little bit more. I mean... Yeah. <laughs> from that exaggeration that, that we can explore comes truth. You have to exaggerate beyond anything you even think is possible and then from that comes a kind of clarity a kind of truth and you know i you know i 
people that I've worked with a lot, my students, they know that I like, I like to uh, make fun of this analogy of how much we have to exaggerate. But you have to exaggerate a lot. So, you know, I, I liken it to cooking. People know I like this analogy about cooking. Do you like to cook, Carlos? Yes, I do. Yeah, I like to cook too. And in cooking, you know, you have, you have salt, right? Yeah. You have fat, you have salt. And you put a little bit of salt at the beginning. You know, frying your onions, a little bit of salt. And as you're making a sauce, a little bit and a little bit more. And then a little bit more. And then a little, little bit more. Right? You don't want too much. A little bit more. That's not how you make music. You go to the cupboard, you take your five kilo bag of salt, you dump yeah. the whole thing in. All right. Then you remove a little bit. Okay. <laughs> so exaggerate. Time. 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 And at first it'll seem silly, like a caricature, and then you just do a little bit less. You have it. Okay. Great. Okay. <laughs> Thank Good. you so much, Juan Carlos. I'm just amazed that that here we are all over the world hearing Bach together and um, not reading the news. It's it's great. It's a great way to spend a few hours. Um, and I'll have to remember that about the salt. I'm always telling my husband that that was maybe a little bit too much salt. So, <laughs> so we'll have to see about that. I also remember from those same sessions, Barry, a time, I, I don't know what, whether it was you or me sitting in the, in the booth listening back to something saying, didn't we do something here? Like, didn't we? No, I'm sure we did something here. Where did it go? I know. So, it's beautiful in our head. Yeah, it's all in our heads. We have one more amazing performance to hear. This is uh, Grace. She's uh, near San Francisco. Um, she studies with Ian Swenson, who is one of my, my great friends and teachers. And she's going to play the 24th Paganini Caprice for us. Hi, Grace.
Well. Hey, maybe you can turn off your, yeah, turn off your, turn on your, there we go. Great. Well, Grace, how old are you? I'm 17. 17. Well, that's, uh, that's pretty remarkable playing for any age. When you're 17, it's spectacular. You're one hell of a violinist. So, um, congratulations. That's really, you know, I think everybody that's hearing that has to admit that that's on an extremely high level. Thank you. Very high level of playing. Um, very professionally done, ready for the big stage. Um, really excellent. Thank you. <laughs> and um, I think the question for me is, um, now what? Right? So how to take it from where you are now, which is very strong, to something that is... <clears throat> Oh my God, that blew my mind, you know? Um, I have to be really honest, just like complete honesty. Um, I know lots of people have written variations on on Paganini's 24th Caprice, lots of other composers, right? Mm -hmm. I don't understand yeah. why. <laughs> For me, it, I never really... Um, I never really found it so spectacular a composition that I would want to write other variations, but others others have, and, and I think I take a lot of um, inspiration from the other composers' variations and how wild they are, how extreme. And I would encourage you to find some of those extremes in your own version of Paganini, because um, it can all start to sound a little bit, I mean, I'm not saying that you're playing it all the same, but I've heard this piece a thousand times. So how can you like slap me and make me listen to it again? Yeah. Take me out of, you know, I have to be convinced this is just the greatest, and I'm not convinced because I don't think you're convinced because <laughs> I think you're trying very hard to play very beautiful, solid and, you know, right? You play the violin, great. Stop playing the violin. I don't care about that. Say something extreme. And I'll tell you where I thought you did that was on... There, you took me somewhere else. Mm -hmm. But after that, what I was hoping for was wild abandon. To contrast, so with. But instead, what I got was very well prepared. Perfect. Mm -hmm. But I didn't want perfect. I wanted crazy. Yeah. Right? To contrast. Mm -hmm. um, a small thing about intonation. Um, these are 24 solo caprices for violin, mm -hmm. not for equal temperament, yucky, awful piano, which plays every note out of tune because it's all equal temperament, which is the worst thing in the world. It's horrible. Equal temperament is horrible, mm -hmm. but we don't have anything better for a piano because we can't retune every octave and every time we modulate but you can play whatever intonation you choose so as an example when you're playing stuff like um, uh, why would you play I would make that interval so tight that it's just like Somebody pulling horn, mm -hmm. 
You know, it should just. Ugh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For real, you know. <laughs> I'm exaggerating, of course, but you know this idea that it's violently out of tune. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, the opening. You can use timing to create the idea of improvisation. So as an example, that amount of I took a little bit of time before returning mm -hmm. and what that's really saying is I'm contemplating I'm deciding what just that little bit of time so that I have the listeners attention something is about to happen Oh, oh! It's, he's playing it. He's playing it again, but it's softer. You know. So I'm playing with expectation. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's a little bit normal. You want to try? Do something. Make it up. I, I like that. And also the um dum, da, 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 dum, da, da, da. I think sometimes you do a good job of making the da, ba, de, ba, dum, belong to the next beat. Sometimes you forget and it's dum da 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 dum This idea of lurching forward, right? Lum I think you can always keep a little bit of that, yeah? Okay, then going on, I thought the next variation was excellent. Really excellent. Maybe a little careful, right? Yeah. I think you can use a little bit more um, energy on the down. So that the up uh, are more thrown rather than it's a little bit controlled. I'd love to. You want to try where you really throw the down? So. I'm getting the same impulse on the first note and the E. I want not I don't want this I don't want the accent on the A. I want that So I would be a little bit more passive on the two grace notes and then explode on the E. Don't accent the first note. Like that for, that's for me i like that better but that's just you know <laughs> go on now show me that crazy intonation okay exaggerate even more tighter semitones <laughs> yeah 
Yeah. That sounds like a like kind of devil music. Mm -hmm. I like it. Okay. Now, the next variation, I thought you did really quite a... Uh, uh, wait, the next one is... Uh, yeah? It's the octaves, yes? Yes. Um, I thought it was very beautiful, very well done. I thought that your thumb... Let me see. I'm going to turn my chair on. Um, I thought your thumb kind of stayed in the same position. And I didn't know why. I would be moving my thumb around. I think you have a shoulder pad, right? Is there a shoulder pad there? Yes. Can you take it off? Then, Grace, just so you know, I play with one. So I'm not saying to perform without one. I'm not making you, you know, feel terrible. But you have to be able to play the violin without one because then you have to use your thumb. <laughs> violin is in your hand and your hand is moving mm -hmm. then the shoulder pad just keeps the violin more stable but it doesn't stop the mobility of the thumb. so could we see try face the other way or? Yeah, sure, sure. you don't need the music it's okay that's good mm -hmm. Okay, so now get now you can put your shoulder pad back on. But I think that's a really important element of playing the violin. I think this really important. Mm -hmm. um, now, in terms of intonation, I think you need to just lean into the bottom string much more. Yeah. Much more. Mm -hmm. And it'll be better in tune. Let's hear. That, that's much better. And then you were doing a better job here than before. The idea of... Uh, uh, okay, so we have... I think if I'm trying to go from here to here, I can either climb up the hill uh, 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 or I can raise my violin and just roll down the hill. Mm -hmm. So I would suggest not so much with your back, mm -hmm. just with your arm. Just go up. Yeah, up. Boom. <laughs> You know, I remember having a, a lesson with Isaac Stern once he came to Toronto and we he arranged they arranged for some young players to play for him. 
and I'm playing from, and the whole time, I'm playing introduction on the capriccioso. And you know, young kid, you just want him to tell you how great you are, right? Yeah. And, and I'm trying to play really well. And the whole time I'm playing, he's taking my scroll and he's lifting it this high. So I'm playing. And I was so mad at him. I'm like, what are you doing? I, I sound terrible. And you're making me sound terrible. But I know what he was. His whole point was. When you shift up, it's really shifting down because your violin is already like this. You're just going down the hill mm -hmm. as opposed to. So I, it's a very simple thing. Just. Okay. Yeah. There's a very good video. I just saw it. Somebody posted it on of, of um, Mark Kaplan. Playing this caprice. Oh my God. He's a really close friend of mine. I really like him a lot. I didn't realize. I mean, I always knew he was good, but oh my God. He's like a magician on the violin. And his violin is like this the whole time. You can find a whole video of him playing that. And it gives you an idea. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Barry. Yes. We have to go. Believe it or not. We are we are towards the end of our time. Okay. Well, look, great. that doesn't mean we have to stop, but but it is. It's about that time of night. Um. Actually, I do one thing on this next variation. It was impressive how hammered it sounded. You know, it really like. It was a little bit like that, but uh, you know, I don't know if that was intentional. I, I got a bit tired of it. Maybe some of the notes could have a bit. Yeah. I don't know. That's just personal. I, it sounded a little bit like I was just getting the front and I didn't actually hear the resonance of the chord. Uh -huh. So you can yeah. you can you can look at that. Just a little more ring. All right, Cecily. Maybe um, before we run away, if anybody's got any questions. Yeah, absolutely. We can take some questions. And Grace, thank you so much for joining us from California. It's morning where you are. It's the end of the night here. <laughs> really great playing. It's great to hear you. Um. We can unmute people. You can turn your video on if you like. You can raise your hands, however we want to do questions. Barry, I'll just tell you that I played for Isaac Stern in the first years that my quartet was together, and he did the same thing to me the entire time. He held my scroll, and he kept saying, don't bow to your elders, which um, our dear friend Tom liked to then repeat back to me for 20 years. <laughs> yeah, he was. And you know, the thing is, if you watch old, oh, I'm going to post some of this stuff because it's like somebody just showed me the video of Isaac Stern playing with piano, the last movement of Vinyavsky's second violin concerto. I don't know if you've ever seen that. Wow. No, I haven't it's seen that. Violin playing. I ever, it's just like, uh, wow. And the violin is just like, bam. Oh. We have a question from Brandon. Brandon. Yes. Hi, Barry. Um, I was just wondering, because you asked us our like three violinists we like to listen to, um, could you give us two dead violinists and two alive violinists that you like to listen to and also why? Yeah, sure. Okay. Dead violinist. Norbert Brainin. And why? Uh, because every single note he plays is grabs me by the throat and makes me listen. It's just, um, I mean, Cecily knows how much I love brain and I know that, that Cecily, you guys, you know, got to, got to work with, I think with him, but um, there's a, um, there's an individuality in his playing that is, I've never heard anything like it. Um, it has to do with, he hears it here, 
and he makes his arms do whatever is necessary for that sound to come out. As an example, uh, the amount of bow he uses. Nobody else, you know, I mean, I mean, I'm not going to try to imitate brain, but to example, literally it's that much bow. So that the, that theme in Brahms takes on a, a kind of feverish, I mean, it's, so it's not about violin playing. It's just, he heard something and he made it happen in the violin. It's just like, wow. So that's one. Um, oh my gosh, there's so many. Uh, oh, I don't know. There's just, there's too many. Um, Chrysler. You know, um, because of the way he speaks, so that the 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 the, the violin playing isn't a, it. It's not so much sung; it's spoken. Every note, it, it's like there's a there's a real old world speech in the which I really love. So those two, and then uh, living. Oh my gosh, there's so many. There's so many. Um, Janine Jansen. I mean, that's just like I. I find myself just enthralled with every note she's playing. I, not because it's all beautiful, but because it's, it's fascinating and and it it yeah. So I really love her playing. I. There's there. I mean, there's there's so many there's so many greats. Um, yeah, I don't know many to name, but. Uh, um, Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I want to say one and then I think of another. So I... Let's get another question. There yeah. is one. Anybody? Yeah, Nelly. So this is kind of random, but I was just wondering if you have any advice for whistling E strings. For whistling E strings? Oh, you know what? Um, I'm not a, some people are, are, are really good string doctors. Like they, they just know this stuff really well. Um, my friend Jonathan Crow, who's concertmaster of the Toronto Symphony, one of the great violinists I know, and he's like a, he's like he just knows he knows the tension of every string. He knows which ones don't whistle. Why he speaks to the guy, you know. Um, but here's my my what I found with E strings. The cheaper ones are the better ones. Never wound with anything. They sound like crap. No gold plated, they sound terrible and they always break. Actually, they don't sound terrible, they just break a lot and they whistle. I go with Westminster, solid steel, and I use various gauges depending on where we are in the seasons. Because if I'm practicing a lot, which I have not now, but if I'm practicing a lot and I get calluses, I need to have thick E strings, otherwise, they just they go in the callus and they, they, they don't. The string doesn't get stopped; it just rattles around in there. So Westminster, they're like a dollar twenty-five, maybe three dollars. I buy them like thirty at a time. I and I, I change them all the time. You know, after a week, and um, yeah, try like a try a twenty-six gauge, and then try a twenty-seven gauge, and then try a twenty-eight gauge, and see which which works for you. But I think, what have you been using? Um, I've been using Eva Prazzi Gold. Yeah, they're expensive. Or the and sometimes the olive label ones as well. But what's on the E string? Prazzi, I think. Yeah, the at the moment it's a um, Eva Prazzi, like the Perastro olive label. Are they wound strings? I think they are, right? No, I'm. This no, is... they're not. I'm not sure. I think they're wound aluminum. Check them out. One yeah. thing I'll. I'll just throw in there about strings. Nelly, how much do you, I mean, you don't have to be 100% honest about this, but about how much do you think you play in a week? How many hours? Oh, I don't know. Some quick maths. Um, maybe 23 hours. Okay, so let, let's go down. Let's say you play 20 hours in a week. <laughs> how long do you think your E string is really gonna last? Um, I don't how know. How many hours? 
maybe. What do you think, Barry? At 20 hours a week, I'd be changing it every couple of weeks. Yeah. I think you can probably plan on about 40 good hours out of an E-string. And then yeah. they start to pop and squeak and scratch. That's why the cheap ones are good. Yeah. I used to change my E-string. When I was in the quartet, I probably changed my E-string every week. Yeah. Just yeah. because I was on it all the time. And and when they die, they don't work. So that's one thing. I mean, you probably need to change your E-string four times as often as the other strings. Yeah. And it's, you know, the other thing is that there are some violins where the E-strings just whistle more than others. Um, I sometimes have that problem on, on um, some of the uh, late 19th century French instruments. I don't know why. They have sometimes the E string. Um, what's your violin? What are you playing on? Um, it's an Italian Riccari from the, is it 20? 40s. Okay, yeah. It's, it's quite new. Just yeah, got it. Modern instruments do whistle more than the old ones. I don't know why that is. I have a modern vine and it sometimes whistles. So you have to sometimes do some more experimenting with, with different types of E strings. Okay. Thank you. And pull your bow straight. Yes. That helps. Other questions? Great. All right. Well, Barry, I can't thank you enough for making the time and taking the time to be here with us today. It's just we're so lucky that we can do this. And to our performers today, to Nelly and Emily and Grace and Juan Carlos, thank you very much for, for um, everything and for your, your hard work and dedication. And we'll be doing this again next week because we're still in lockdown. So right. next week we have a really special class. I just want to tell you about it a little bit and then We'll all go do our thing for the rest of the day. Uh, Daniel Pioro, he's a brilliant young UK violinist. Um, I met him in a session. We were we were deskies at a session, and I got to talking to him. And then I then I heard his prom. And if you haven't seen the prom that he did last summer, find it and watch it. It's extraordinary. Uh, Daniel does a lot of kind of experimental and contemporary music. And I thought that's what he'd want to hear in the really big class, but no, he said he wanted to hear Bach. He wanted to hear the first, third and fifth movements of the D minor partita. And he is going to spend some time exploring. He called it, he, he wrote something really beautiful to me that I don't have in front of me, but he called it exploring the, the what you find in contemplation and sort of the unknowable Un, unachievable thing that you can get to and how to get there. So I, I kind of want to play, but you know, we'll leave it all to you um, to do that playing. I think we actually have a violist who's going to play the Sarabande of that, of that Bach and it, it'll be a really special evening. And Daniel's just a wonderful person too. So hopefully he'll play for us. I, I'm hoping we'll get some of him too. And as always, I hate to do this, but if you were inspired or uh, excited by what you heard tonight and have the means, send us a dollar, send us a pound, send us five pounds. I'll turn over whatever we raise over to Barry and it's just a way to get some money flowing in this strange, strange time. So don't, don't send me any money, but <laughs> whatever money you can and, and, and find a good use for it. I'm happy to do this class. I'm, I'm one of the few very lucky people that I'm still being paid by my by your institution. Well, thank you, Barry. That's that's incredibly generous. Um, and thank you for your time. Really, I, I I just will say one last thing, which is that anytime I had to contact you in 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 previous life, I was like, ah, oh, Barry's so busy. I don't know if he'll will he get back to me. I do. I really need to bother him with this email. And um, the thought that you would just give us this time is is extraordinary. So. Thank you. And good night, everybody. See you next time. Thanks, Mark. Great sound. Bye. Yeah.